and welcome once again to another episode of the Horizon Roundtable. I am Bob McDonald, and you can find me on Twitter at Bob McDonald. And with me is my co-host Jimmy Lemke. Hello, everybody. How are your days? Don't answer that. It was rhetorical. <laughs> and Jimmy is on Panther. Uh, is fun. on Twitter at Panther U. And uh, you can <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter, uh, the podcast on Twitter at Horizon RT. Um, so, as we mentioned last episode, because we spent all the last episode talking about Motor City Madness and you know that whole thing that went down there, we didn't even get a chance to get to talk about the actual schedule and the actual television schedule. So, Jimmy. Yeah. I want to start with the schedule first, and I want to talk about point to something you talked about, alluded to last episode, where you mentioned, yes. where you talked about specifically about the idea of trying not to schedule games while schools are on break, and the Horizon League didn't listen to you like even a little bit because well, I, I, it involves actually putting in effort. And I don't, I don't know how the Horizon League really works. I know from talking to other people that the offices over there are kind of, a, you know, it's kind of a skeleton crew. It's kind of a small, you know, kind of dank. I don't know what the <laughs> word is. It's kind of a small office that's, you know, kind of crappy. Like I, don't, I, just, I think of the Horizon League as kind of like this, like, mom and pop store. And they're trying to like do you know national television rights contracts and trying to put together like major events and they're doing it with like five people or something. I I, I don't know. <laughs> so so maybe a lot of these criticisms, maybe these are some of these things are things they want to do and they just don't do it because they don't have the money. And in that case, I'd say maybe we should have been putting all of our twenty thousand dollars per school into, uh, you know, giving that to the Horizon League so that they could, you know, deal with that crap. Possibly. But, you know, hire another person. But, like, you know, scheduling is not hard. And they also have to do it for a bunch of sports. So I will put a caveat here. I'll be magnanimous and say, look, you know, it's it's hard to do a schedule when you're, you know, you got a skeleton crew. Well, here's my other question, too. And I think this kind of speaks to how everything's kind of moved up on the ske- on, on the basketball schedule in general. Because yes. many years, for, for many years up until probably maybe like, not even, in fact, I think this year is kind of a little different because you have games starting in the, you know, the first full week of November. I mean, I know, like for, yeah. like for example, Cleveland State is playing their first game at Davidson on November 6th. I have never seen, I've never, this is the first time I've seen a bas- the basketball schedule start so early in the year. And oh, you yeah, are, they, yeah. Moved, they, moved it, they moved it up. Yeah. So, and I they, mean, they, we're literally just yeah, a few so, days away from the actual start of the practice schedule. So Yeah, which I think uh, the official you know, the official practice schedule starts, you know, th- this last week of uh this lack of last week of September when in years past it was sometime in October. Now obviously because of that, now it appears that you have this last week of December which the Horizon League has decided to populate with games as opposed to say last year when you know you were still seeing non-conference, you know, not you know, the Horizon League schedule started in the beginning of January. So, um, so there is that part of it. So, yeah. so with that said, you do have a and you do have a situation, of course, where um, you, but still, the fact still remains is that. You like, like for example, let's look at the. If you look at the first week of games, uh, the first week in the game starts on Friday, December twenty eighth. Um, you have you have Cleveland State and Youngstown State hosting the Friday and Sunday games, and then you have Wright State and Northern Kentucky also hosting Friday and Sunday. Um, so it, it, it seems to me that those are probably going to be games that. And let's be realistic, you know, 
I don't know about Wright State in northern, in northern Kentucky. I suspect that their attendance numbers will be a bit different. Cleveland State and Youngstown yeah. State, on the other hand. Although Youngstown State last year did actually have kind of a little bump in attendance, although the first game they have this year is against, uh, the, in the conference schedule is against Detroit Mercy, so you have that too. So, you know, you, you have that going against you. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Wright State in Northern Kentucky, uh, I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's, I, I'd, I'd like to avoid, I, I wish they could avoid having people play those games. I like the first weekend. Like, I, li- I like the weekend where they do, like, the first weekend of December. I like having that for conference games. So I'd, I'd be fine with continuing some kind of arrangement with that. That's interesting um, you don't do that anymore. Um, and, and I always I, thought they should market it. You know, we're like, they were like, we're the only conference that did that. And yeah. the conference standing stood for almost a month. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was cool. Like, I, I figured it was like, call it like an opening weekend thing. This is what the, you know, this is something that's a Horizon League tradition. You, you market it as something that, the that e, the ESPN family of networks can you know put out there like oh hey it's opening weekend yeah. the Panthers and Phoenix are visiting you know UIC and IUPUI this this week like let's let's talk about these and then you know they could they could use it as like a they could have a studio thing put Adam Amin in there it would look great it would be nice but which they've done before which they've done before and incidentally I mean you know you had even if you put uh, if you had put those four Friday the 28th games, uh, so those four games on Friday the 28th and Sunday, December 30th, if you put those four games into, uh, as opposed to that last weekend of December to, say, the first weekend of December. Yeah. You have, you have four ga- You would have, you know, it's pretty obvious, and we'll talk about this a little later on the podcast, it's pretty obvious that ESPN has gone to, you know, the, has gone into the, we're going to be broadcasting Horizon League games on Friday nights. I think that's been pretty much baked in the cake for like the last couple of years. But uh, to your yeah. point, to your point, you would if you had done that, you would have had four different. You'd had four games to choose from in terms of the fr- that Friday game. Right, and you know, given the given kind of the way, so but that's not, uh, and and more to the point. If you're looking at the fir- if you had looked at the first weekend of December, yes, you would have also had, and this is important because it, it speaks to what we discussed last episode, is you still have students that are sitting on campus right now at that point. The semesters, are, you know, the school school is still in session last weekend of December for pretty much everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, for the, so so. In that in that regards, and I think that was kind of the mind, the thought process, and this didn't happen last year, but it happened in years past, where perhaps that was the better way to go. Because a, you're gonna get if you're in the first weekend of December, to your point, you're gonna be the you're gonna be one of the only teams, you're gonna be one of the only conferences out there that is doing it right at that right at that point in December. Uh, maybe a couple of, I think maybe a couple of major conferences are doing that now, but the Horizon Week in particular would be doing that. But more to the point, again, you'd be able to maximize the attendance because you would also have that student element coming in. Right, right, right. However, um, that didn't happen. Yeah, I mean they could they could capitalize on that first that first week by doing four games of. Yeah, you know, the first Friday you do four games and the you know four whatever games and then like the big like main event, you could have like two teams that are put towards the top, with that are also rivals. Obviously, at this moment we're talking about Wright State and Northern Kentucky, mm-hmm. who are both both you know teams that could win the Horizon League. Sure. Put them put them because because when you're doing the schedule, there's f- four games between teams that are doing travel partners and then and then one right. game for the actual travel partners and then that's the only game they play that week. Mm-hmm. So I would think that like for a Horizon League opening weekend, you know, because they have that Friday spot with the uh you know, they have that Friday spot with the con- with the ESPN, 
that they could market those. And then the big that big game for whatever it's ESPNU or ESPN two. This is like the first conference rivalry game of the regular season for for whatever for any conference. Like this is the first conference rivalry game. This is one that could have have a major effect on the you know the the goings out of the conference. One team gets a way to get a leg up. Um for a whole month before the rest of the conference season gets going, they get a leg up on their, on their travel partner rival, as well as, you know, the best team. And then that's, that's a game that you pick for television. I I would think that it would be an obvious choice to do considering what what they're, what they need, which is eyes on the conference. And that's a game. That's a game that if it's a good game gets on sports center, Mm Mm-hmm. Even even at the stand the stance of our co- of our you know uh, conference, which at the moment is in the twenties. Even at, even with that, you have the national TV contract, so we got to get we get a smattering games on national television. Mm-hmm. Obviously, ESPN could be pitched that this could be a smart idea. Put out you know the right state Northern Kentucky game the first week of December. These two teams are going to be vying for the conference championship. This is the first conference. This is the first conference game of the season for any conference, mm-hmm. or or it could be after the first four games of the travel partners against each other, and sure. then you just you end it with the or and then you do like a you know the Friday night at you know nine o'clock or eight o'clock or something. So you do it late enough that you can get the whole country. Granted, this whole country. When I say whole country. There's only going to be a certain amount of people that are going to be interested in the game, but you want to maximize that number. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of people on the West Coast that love basketball, so you want them to be able to, you want to be able to, you know, put put something out there where everybody's got it. So like a an eight o'clock or nine o'clock start Eastern for that right state, you know, Northern Kentucky game, just as an idea, and then that's how that's how you push it. You know, there there you go. I think I would think that that would make the most sense. Um, there are many things that would make sense that just apparently don't anymore. It's <laughs> it's really just another. it's it's really just you know the Horizon League needs ideas, people with ideas, and, and the ability to implement those ideas. And we need we need people who are um, you know very you know, willing to put a lot of themselves into the work in the time that is not the best, which is like the summer when there's no actual games, you have to do, you know, you have to put in the work to get there and the horizon league should be, you know, they're in Indianapolis, which one thing that we don't talk about that is a major benefit of that office is that people who want to work for the NCAA or how, or, you know, Indianapolis is a good area for potential employees other than maybe Chicago. Like maybe Chicago would be better just because it's a a, a much larger talent pool, but people who want to work in the, you know, the NCAA Mm -hmm. getting into the NCAA headquarters city where there's Mm -hmm. a conference based and then a couple schools is a good, you know, it's good talent pool to draw from. Sure. So, so, there's got to be some ambitious kids out there who the Horizon League can hire at low cost where we can put them in a room and get ideas out of them on how to grow the brand, grow the, you know, make the marketing work to the point where the Horizon League actually has, you know, actually starts to grow as a conference. Because that's what, that, that's what we all need out of this is a, we need a conference to grow. Yeah. How do we do that? We need it. We need we need people with ideas. And honestly, Mark Adams is out there too. Yes, Mark Adams, who works for ESPN, he's at Enthusi Adams. Uh, we definitely want to get Mark on the show at some point. We do. Mark has sat down with conferences. Why? Why have we not? And maybe we have him. We just haven't publicized. But why do we not get Mark Adams to sit down with Horizon League and say, okay, I've been talking to this conference and this conference. Scheduling needs to get better. Why don't we have to do this? Mm-hmm. 
And because the Horizon League has fallen back and the Summit League has gotten better, as much as uh, much to our chagrin of our 2009 selves, we have to consider the idea of doing a Horizon League Summit League challenge during the season. Where maybe instead, maybe maybe instead of this, instead of saying like, okay, here's here's the Horizon League Summit League challenge. It's the same format as the Missouri Valley Big West Challenge, or not M- Missouri Valley and Mountain West Challenge, or the same as the you know Big Ten ACC Challenge. Instead of doing that, maybe we make it like every team plays two or three games, mm-hmm. and then you can build a schedule from there. And then every team that plays two or three games, and the conferences pick the teams. You know, the Horizon League picks their, their, you know, one through eight or whatever the Summit League has. The Summit League picks their one through eight. And then each of those teams that play, play a return game the next year to create, because scheduling is such a problem. The Horizon League and Summit League could knock out four non-conference games right there. Mm-hmm. And because they're putting their best teams up, that would be, you know, theoretically, you have a minimum of three, probably four games where the top you know, team in the Horizon League is playing the top two teams in the Summit League and vice versa two, for, because you'll have the first the, the two games and then the next year the return games for those. So they've got four games and they're all quality games. Mm-hmm. And because you do it, because you rank the teams, now – those teams that are not doing so hot are playing other teams that aren't doing so hot. So maybe they have a better chance to win, but they're not also not bagging the other team, other leagues, top RPI teams. The more games that the you know, the more games at the horizon league, and I assume that we're going to get stronger because there's really, I, th- I think we've hit a floor as a conference. Yes. I assume we're going to get back to, you know, back to a strength where we're in the teens. Maybe it's the 18 or 19, but we're still in the teens. And the Summit League maybe hits like their absolute ceiling of like 14, 15, or maybe it's like 12. I mean, who knows? But like you get these two conferences together, the more games they play against each other, that's the less games that you have for Youngstown State to play. And I'm not, not like a, I'm not talking about like the D, the, the non D ones like Tiffin or those, but the less games they have to play against St. Francis of Pennsylvania, where they're playing a Division One team that is more like a, a Dino, Division One in name only. You know, it's you, you don't want you don't want Horizon League teams to be forced to play. You know, forced to go out and get bad games. So the less opportunity they have to do that, the better. So the Horizon League needs to start looking at, okay, we need to start either putting out and setting a specific set of guidelines that will require our teams to play better, mm-hmm. or or we need to start talking about setting up as many challenge games as possible against other conferences that are good or, you know, good or at least not terrible, and then we can start talking about, okay, well, hey, if – Wright State is only playing teams that are, you know, they, they play two Summit League teams that are the top two teams, so they're 75 to 150 in the RPI or whatever the new – I can't remember what they're calling the new one. We're going to have to do an episode on that, by the way. The net, N-E-T, that's what it is. So maybe they're 75 to 150 rank in the net. Mm-hmm. And like, I will reiterate, we definitely need to do an episode on that. But once, yeah. once, we, once we do one on the net – you know, say say seventy five to one hundred and fifty in the net. Wright State's got two of those games, and then say the next two games that are return games, like the year later, like for the teams that they played the year before, are you know teams that are a hundred to two hundred in the net. Those are four games that are not harpoons to their RPI or mm-hmm. their their net. They're, those are four games that are not harpoons. They've got uh you know the the. 18 conference games and then two to four games in the Horizon League tournament. So you've 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 already well in the for the regular season you've got 18 and four says 22. So Wright State now only has to get you know eight games or 10 if they do a uh, an in season tournament an ex- exempt tournament. So all of a sudden Wright State doesn't have as much to go out and get. And maybe we do that with not just the Summit but the MAC. And all of a sudden. Wright State's playing North Dakota State, South Dakota State, just assuming that these are the number one two teams in each conference. Mm-hmm. And then 
playing like I don't know who's number one and two in the MAC right now, like Buffalo and Akron or whoever. I don't. I, I don't pay much attention to the MAC. I think of them as a football conference, but whoever the two best you know, teams yeah. are in the MAC, mm-hmm. and then you get returning games with them the next year, all of a sudden you have scheduled eight games of right state schedule against teams that should be uh, pretty good to great. That there is a downside in that. What if one of those teams like suffers a catastrophic injury or two, and all of a sudden the team is not good? Okay. But I think it's worth. I think it's worth the risk to get that. You know, get that not having to worry about the schedule that on their schedule off of their shoulders, and you also make that announcement in the middle of like summer or something. So you work on you work on making that schedule in the late spring. Mm-hmm. You know, at the same time that the Horizon League is working on its baseball tournament. So then, you know, come June or July, you've got something to announce, and maybe you maybe you do a deal like uh, is the Horizon. Eisenleaf still got its sponsorship with Nike, if I remember correctly. I believe maybe so, you yeah. make that. Maybe you make that. You know, figure out with Nike if it's even possible. But you mm-hmm. make that announcement with Nike at an AAU tournament. You don't have any teams doing anything. Mm-hmm. But the conference announces it's oh hey we're doing this. You know the Horizon League Summit League and the Horizon League Mac or you know which, whichever one of those conferences is also with Nike. You know, do a here's our announcement. Here we go. Here's our here's our challenge that we have coming up this year. These are some pretty good teams. Mm-hmm. Now you've got people that are in the college basketball world doing what they do in the summer, which is follow the the recruiting area. Look at that, and then they'll be able to you know make a make more informed decisions on you know what you know the, the, their their awareness for the horizon is 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 grown. Sure. Their awareness for the Summit League or the MAC is grown. Okay. So we, we, we raise some awareness. We schedule four to eight games, four year four in the first year, eight in the second year of the of a team's schedule. So they don't have to worry as much about finding, you know, quality teams. And then now all of a sudden you know, Wright State has, you know, four to six games to schedule rather than eight to ten. Mm-hmm. And now they, you know, do you go out and you play? You know, now you're of right state deciding, do is are we good enough to, are we going to go knock on Cincinnati's door and walk in and beat the crap out of them? Uh-huh. I'm, sure, I'm sure Northern Kentucky would love to, and I'm sure Cincinnati has no interest in that. But um, it, it's fun, it, to your point, by the way, that actually the the you the Northern Kentucky you the Cincinnati that those games are that game is happening. Um, I is it really? The, yeah, uh, I, oh, I yeah. So I think I guess the only wrinkle is the return game to Northern Kentucky, but that that's literally it. But yeah, that's happening. Are they doing a home and home? I I believe that's what the point is. I think that's what they're looking at right now. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure that I. This yeah, is where I, it would have been nice to have Jack Alley or somebody on the podcast. Nah, we'll get to him later. What we got? Northern um, Kentucky. <laughs> We want you on this podcast. We need some Valhalla people. We need people. We'll get to, I'd like we'll, to have. We'll get to you. Yeah. It's partially my fault. I'm I've procrastinated this week. That's on me. So anyway, um, but you, to your other point, uh, to your point about this 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 conference to conference challenge. Now, if I understand it correctly, I do believe Mark Adams has had a conversation with the Horizon League, and I can't remember with about which conference, so I don't think it was either the MAC or the Summit, but I think it was with a, another conference. Now, to your other point, it, and it's funny you mentioned the... It's funny you mentioned both the MAC and the Summit, because with the Horizon League, a lot of the Horizon League teams are already, even down the road, have are, are already scheduling those games anyway. It, you know, like for... You know, you see... With the Horizon League teams, a lot of the Horizon League teams, they're already scheduling. They're still even when they're scrambling, they're still scheduling. You're still scheduling MAC teams. They're still scheduling Summit League teams. But to your point, it would it would make a little. It would make much more sense if instead of just scrambling to try to get, you know, MAC teams and and Summit League teams and the Horizon League teams together. At the last minute, in like July or in like August or something, instead right. of doing that, get them together in, you know, even get them, to, even get all these people in the room during the final four. They're all there anyway. Get them A in lot the room. Of... Get them in the room and say, "Hey, so I, here's the thing. 
we are now in a situation where mid majors have to band together because you are at a point where all these Power Five conferences are scheduling. You know, they're they're going from eighteen games to twenty games in their conference schedule. They're doing that. We see it all over the place, which means it's there's smart. less and less opportunity for uh, you know. And sure, you'll get a buy game or something like that down the road, but you know. There's not going to be the opportunity to scramble around. You you need to instead of doing this thing, doing the scheduling thing piecemeal, as mid majors have in general have done forever. Mm-hmm. We need to band together. They need to band together, and I think we need to band together. And, and from what it looks like, I think it's kind of at the center of this is in fact, and it, it, it seems it seems, and I it's I as I understand it correctly, it is Mark Adams at the at the center of this. So go to the final four. And put right. your heads together and put together something like a, Ma- a, a a Horizon League Summit Challenge or a Horizon League Mac Challenge. Put those things together. And then, again, and then you don't have to worry about having to scramble at the last minute and have your schedule announced in September. When well, I don't think that they... When you have the... When you, when you when, it, when, in, when instead of having a golden opportunity to say, you know, to your season ticket holders, all right, well, we're selling, we're starting our season ticket sales, you know, at the end of the season, we'll let you know about the schedule, whatever. And you know, right. if if you're one of those early, if you're one of those early renewers, you get to spend five six months sitting there, you know, in mystery of you know who's mm-hmm. going to be at my who's going to be in my arena. In yes. this case, though. You'll know already. You'll you'll have a good you'll have a much better idea. There's going to be less of a mystery, and also more to the point. I mean, the other thing too is potentially no, probably not probably not going to happen. But you know the 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 scheduling of the non D one uh, these non D one teams is going to happen. It's it, I I I I know Horizon League fans bristle at the fact. That they have to schedule that you you have these non D one teams scheduled on your on your conference schedule on your on your team schedule mm-hmm. can't it can't be helped I mean it's one of those things where I sit there and I'm like okay wonderful you know like for example Cleveland State is playing like right I think after they come home from uh, they they're playing Urbana I think they're playing Urbana on like a Tuesday night the same day that the you know that the Cavs are playing at home and I'm like okay what's the point of this but the point of that is to fill out a schedule that's that's what and they, and, and and they're and I feel like on some level Cleveland State's packing it in I, the good news well here's uh, what is, I thought which I now, know is really down bad news but without LeBron you don't have yeah. Well, you here's what to I'm thinking too. Also, much. too, had they not scheduled that game, they would be a full. Had they not scheduled that game, I believe they would be like a full, almost a full week without a game. So, which in, early in the season is probably not a great idea. So, I, I see kind of the the logic behind kind of keeping you know keeping the competitive continuity going. You know, the the team they're playing is you know they're probably going to beat the crap out of them by like thirty or forty, but. Again, it, it's more of uh, kind of keeping keeping the continuity going. Otherwise, you're going to be a week out. You're going to be almost a week out not playing, and even in the beginning of the season, that's that's gonna that that could lend to lend a little bit of rust too. So I totally get that. And again, it, it, that's just one example. I see that it at this point in time, I I see that as you're not gonna. I don't want to say you're gonna. You could potentially eliminate that possibility, but I, I, honestly, I don't see that going away. I don't. I don't see a. You know, it, it's a, again, it's a mid-major bugaboo in general, where you know scheduling non-D1 teams is. It, it is the norm now. I don't. We don't want it to be the norm, but it's always been the norm. It's been the norm for decades. Yep. Um, I'd like to avoid it at all costs, but it's not. It, I I see now that it is absolutely unavoidable. Right? Do we want to have more? Do we want to have more than one non D one team on a Horizon League schedule? Yes, that would be the ideal pie in the sky dream. Right. But realistically, that's not going to be the case, and it hasn't been the case for again. It hasn't been the case for years. You know, and again, I think. 
if you get to a point where you have a potential for the a say if you have a t- potential for a Horizon League Summit Challenge and or and or Horizon League Mac Challenge you kind of reduce the you kind of reduce the opportunity or the need to have that many non D1 teams. Again, you don't completely eliminate it, but say for example, if you have games in these, you know, conference conference challenges, plus you add in a buy game or two, plus you add in potentially an exempt tournament. You know, that that fills out your schedule pretty quickly. And if you can figure that out in, you know, April or May as opposed to August or uh, July or August, all the better for you. And furthermore, gives you a much better opportunity to sell that schedule to your potential season ticket holders or your current season holders who might be on the uh, season ticket holders who might be on the fence about you know renewing. Right. Which of course is a real pro- which again be again nature of the beast. It is kind of a real problem when it comes to mid majors being able to schedule and being able to cater to a an ever. I don't want to say ever dwindling base of season ticket holders, but you you can't deny you can't deny the fact that you you need to get an opportunity to you know you know be build a season ticket holder base that is. For lack of a better term, decidedly younger, mm-hmm. and that's important. You know, you, you you've got a young, you've got younger graduates in there who are wanting to potentially be season ticket holders, but at the same time, they don't want to sit around and wait for you know when the when these games are going to come out. And again, in spite of the fact that there's no LeBron, how do you sell a recent graduate of Cleveland State on? Okay. We we want you to have we we're, we're you know season tickets are out today. Here's a game. Here you've got to buy a game against Urbana. Oh, by the way, they're a non division one team and they're playing the same way time against the Cavs. They're playing at the same time as the Cavs. LeBron or no LeBron? I mean, what, what, if, if you're a you know if you're a younger generation Cleveland State fan, you know you know if you if you got the choice of watching a Cavs game, you know. Even without LeBron, you still have Kevin Love, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. Um, yeah. Even if you, you know, it, it's it's still an, uh, you still are looking at an experience at at Quicken Loans Arena that is, to be honest, Superior. unrivaled. It's unrivaled. It is. If you've been to Quicken Loans Arena, you know the experience you have. You love. Even that's that's how they were able to. They you know they 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 push themselves. To make that an unrivaled experience, put that up against Cleveland State at the Wolstein Center against a D two team. Well, you have to do things, and I, I'll, I'll say this: first off, you're never going to be an NBA experience, so we can no, just put that to bed at the moment right away. Again, but you can't be. That's what I'm saying. You can't beat that. You're not going to be. You that. have to. You have to leverage your. You have to, you have to leverage what what makes what works for you. And what works for what works for the Cleveland states of the world is that you're you're trying to get alumni, and the one yes. thing the alumni all have in common is that they all went to your school. I realize yes. that sounds that sounds uh, well, duh, like obvious, but not really. I don't think that I don't think that programs really take advantage of that. The hurrah, like in Milwaukee. Uh, Sandy Botham and I had this idea years and years ago where we were talking about um, we need to we need to make a homecoming. They started this parents weekend on uh, in November. It was late October, November. They would you know some somewhere in October and they would have parents come. It would be there would be like they like they'd include a soccer game in that, but it would yeah. and it would ha- it would there would be more attendance than normal games, but it wouldn't be like a big deal to them. And then they would, but the the real center was here. We're having a uh, we're having a networking event this night, and then there's a you know something going on for you know parents. There's just some events on campus, and then Sunday they did the the, the Panther Prowl, which is the five k that they used to raise scholarship money uh-huh. for the for the university for the general scholarship fund sure. and uh Sandy and I said okay you know this is obviously you know the timing of this 
you know, what it is, when it is, we need, this should be a, this should be a homecoming weekend. Mm-hmm. And the reason that this should be a homecoming weekend is because it's fall. We don't have football, but we can, you know, we can still include a soccer game. But you need you make it a homecoming weekend. Maybe we even do a parade, or maybe yeah. we even do these. Th- and and Panther Powell still can be like kind of that centerpiece event because it's the good event where you're raising money. Which I'm but- glad you mentioned all of this because the this is what Cleveland State is actually doing this week. I know we're these recording are- on a Sunday. We're actually doing every single one of the every single one of the things you just mentioned. They're doing this week. They're doing a parade. They're doing a. They actually uh, they kicked off homecoming with a volleyball game. They're also doing a soccer game, and they do a bunch of they do all of these things already. They actually do all and more to the point. And I actually alluded to this. Uh, I actually alluded to this on Twitter. Is that a as part of this? They're actually having a conversation with Dennis Felton, the, the head coach of Cleveland State. Well, so so that's interesting. You mentioned that 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 is kind of a, an idea. It sounds like it's kind of an idea at Milwaukee. That's actually it, two Cleveland State. Right? They're actually doing that there now. It needs to evolve, and we need to look at it as to sure. every, everything with these universities is about garnering interest, getting people around, yes, and exactly. especially especially when it comes to our basketball programs that yes. don't have the followings of a lot of these other places. So what you need to do is yeah. you need to offer things to your alumni and to the community that you cannot otherwise get sure. uh, at, at a Cavs game or a Bucks game yeah. or a Cincinnati Reds game. Yeah. You offer them the, uh, the opportunity. Uh, you offer them the opportunity for a networking event, Yeah, a, net, a networking event based around the game and, okay. but, and to specialize it, so UWM is doing a homecoming this year. Uh, you need the you need each school when they have their homecoming. You need to go to each school in the university and say, okay, look, we're having a homecoming basketball game. They they moved it to November. They're actually doing it now. So I don't know about the I don't think they're doing a parade, but they're doing most everything else. Yeah. They moved it to November. It's not it's separate from the Panther Prowl weekend now, so that's fine. But like, okay. what what you need to do is go to each school. You give them a block of tickets. You give the give the school of uh you know you give the school of nursing fifty tickets for free. Mm-hmm. The tickets are all next to each other. Offer to help uh, set up with like for uh, for for because we play downtown. We have the Hyatt across the street. We have the Hilton a couple blocks away. We have a few. We have places nearby that can host things, or we could even do it inside the arena. I'm sure that once the Bradley Center is torn down. And then they build something in that space between the Panther Arena and the new Bucks Arena, the the Forum. I refuse to call it the Pfizer Forum. Once they have something built between the Forum and the, you know, the Panther Arena, <coughs> or let's call it the Milwaukee Arena if we're going to talk about the right names. So from the Milwaukee Arena, the Mecca to the Forum, you have the space for the Bradley Center. Is there's going to be something built there at that at some point in the near future? If it's if there's a hotel as part of it or restaurant as part of it, there you go. There's there's space right there. <clears throat> Each school, you know, fifty to a hundred tickets, depending on the size of the school. And it's not like it's 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 homecoming, but it's like it's not like UWM with their eleven thousand seat arena is is going to have trouble finding places for these schools to put fans. It's not like. It's not like, oh, you know, maybe we shouldn't give 100 tickets to the College of Letters and Science because we the 100 tickets is a lot of tickets. I don't know if we should do – no, it's a stupid idea. Give them the tickets. Yeah. You give them the tickets. Of course. And you, and you, and, and you make sure that it's in the area where they've actually, like, truncated the, the season ticket holder space mm-hmm. to only be sections around the court. It, it actually – Went with a it came along with a rise in ticket prices because now you no longer have the ability to get the cheap tickets away, but uh, for the whole season now you got to do it on a game by game basis. Uh-huh. But like, but but what what they've got now is they've got a horizon. You know, they've got the, the Milwaukee's got this. You know, they'll have a game where they're really close to the court. Then you throw in here's the block of fifty tickets for the, you know. College of Information Study, you know, Information Studies. Here's the College of Letters and Science. Here's a College of Nursing. Put them all together, 
at, you have then there, you have something for every other media timeout during the game. You can acknowledge distinguished alumni from each one, each college that has people in attendance at the game. And truthfully, I think that they should do that for every basketball game they have. And but maybe apart from that, um, you but then you do like the homecoming where you get every college involved. And then each game you have, because there's like 13 or 14 colleges at the university, everyone can take a game. And it, you, you, long story short, and I'm sorry that I rambled on this, but you, you, you leverage what you have. Yeah. And each of our universities have a, a group of people that paid us a lot of money to attend our place and learn from our place so they could get that degree that gets sets them up to start their careers and their adult lives. And now that they're in those adult lives, we need to pull them back. Yes. And too, too often, UWM did a really nice thing. I wish that they would be a little more uh, – I wish they'd be a little more explicit about this – but they've separated the UWM Foundation that raises money from the UWM Alumni Association that just really? does that just does networking events and stuff. Yeah, really? Wow, that's not. It's it's, it's not. It's a Sorry. little weird. But I will say this: I prefer it. I think that whoever came up with that uh, did a did a great job because we have a lot of alumni and they don't like getting phone calls about raising money. <laughs> But you set up a networking event, and the foundation will have somebody there to talk to them about what's yeah. going on in the university. Sure. So you have you have opportunity to to leverage what you have, which is the academic side of the university, to help the basketball side of the university, mm -hmm. which will in turn the stronger a basketball pro program is, the better it is for the academic side of the university. You, you need to work with each other. And there's a, in, in Wisconsin here, the gold standard for using that is, uh, is Donna Shalala. She's now, she's been at, I think she's still at Miami. I don't know if she's at Miami. Uh, no, she's actually running for Congress. Is she really? She is. Well, and well, yeah, good luck to she, her. She, she, yeah, she's kind of phoning it in. So, is, uh, uh, but anyway. Is, is, I, I do have to make a crack. Is Nevin Shapiro one of her big oh, donors for her? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Isn't he still in jail, man? Out of jeez. I'm sure know. he's still in jail, but you can you can still wire money from jail. <laughs> but, but unless he had to pay restitution, I don't know. But when, <laughs> so Donna Donna Shalala became chancellor at Madison in the 80s, in the late 80s, and she she recognized that the university, which had been a laughing stock in sports for a very yes. long time except for hockey where it was one of the better teams, but they didn't have a big 10 in hockey anyway, so it doesn't matter. The, the, they've been a laughing stock in big 10 sports, mainly football, yeah. basketball for a very long time. They were. And what she understood was that the athletic side of the university is the marketing side of the university. If you, if you take away what they actually are, which is, students bouncing a ball or throwing a ball. If you take that out of it, what is, what is it? It's getting people to show up to see your, you know, see you basically market your university to them for a couple hours. Yeah. It's marketing for the university. Yes. So when, yes, when you, when you recognize that that is what the athletic department is, is not, not only some marketing, but the best marketing your university has. Mm -hmm. Once you recognize you have that, you and and you and you're willing to invest. And I don't just mean money. In fact, a lot of times I don't mean money, but you invest the time and effort to leverage that. Yeah. Because um, have you ever seen the program, the football movie? Yes, yes. James Kahn, who played the head coach in that, has this great line. Where he's, uh, I think he's trying. He's trying to get his crappy backup quarterback reinstated because the starter is like in rehab. I believe the, I, and I think I'm paraphrasing here. And you don't get eighty thousand people to watch a chemistry test. I think that exactly. Was the, that I think was it's a biology was exam. Or, yeah, Doesn't matter. Like and that's that. the point. You don't get eighty thousand people to show up for that. At Milwaukee, we have gotten eleven thousand people to show up to watch a basketball game. Mm -hmm. So you need you, you have that opportunity there. 
yeah. to get you have the opportunity to get that. Yes. So Milwaukee needs to leverage what it has. It has a Division One basketball program that okay. has some history, maybe not the greatest history, but some history with some real a Sweet Sixteen that your program and my program and a couple Horizon League programs have done. But only like six. There's still only like sixty, seventy schools in NCAA history that have been to the final or to, been to the Sweet Sixteen. We have that. Cleveland yes. State has that. Did, they didn't yes, get which is that didn't, why we'll never let it go. Didn't get vacated. Years later. <laughs> that didn't get vacated, right? So, um, but actually, also to your point, and to the marketing way of your point, you will also notice that when you have a, a team that does well in an NCAA tournament. Sure. You also, and, and this is true, you, you also find yourself, as a university, Getting more applications to your institution. Look this at, happens. Uh, this happens. It, it, it happens everywhere. It's everywhere. It's well documented. Yes. Um, Butler's first Final Four run mm-hmm. netted the university something like six hundred million dollars of free advertising. Yes. Uh, Butler's basketball program will not spend that amount of money f- for the next fifty years. Never. So where what are we what are we talking about? You you your basketball program because we don't play football. Our exactly. basketball program is where and it's our men's basketball program. Apologies, Amanda Brom. It's your men's basketball program needs to be there. Green Bay aside, because Green Bay has the benefit of nothing else going on once the Packers season ends. So Green Bay's women's basketball team, which is an absolute dynasty. Yes. They're able to leverage that, and that's good for them. And Absolutely. I'm glad they're able to do that. And I would love to be able to do it with our women's basketball team down here. It's easier to do it with the men's team. So that's why you that's why you care about what conference your team is in and how good that conference is and what teams are on your schedule and are the teams better and and are is your coach good enough and is the recruiting are the recruiting class is good enough and who's starting at point guard and who's making the shots and who do we have who do we have on the schedule next year and are we going to play in any tournaments are we going to host a tournament what do we these are why these things need to be important to the chancellor yes. presidents of our universities and it hasn't been the case here with Milwaukee since Nancy Zimfer and real, well, really, Carlos Santiago, who succeeded her in 2004, but he really he saw it and then saw Bruce Pearl leave, and that kind of like there was a vacuum really that like came in. Nobody's Bruce Pearl. Rob Jeter really never had a chance with those people. So it was you 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 need to have somebody that understands what it is. Here, Mark Money, I don't think he gets it, and by don't think I'm about 99.9 percent sure that the guy has no uh, fucking idea as to what okay. the athletic department, specifically the men's basketball program, can be. Well, if if this guy understood what a successful men's basketball program would mean for his job performance and his bottom line and the things that matter to him, which are admission, enrollment, applications, student retention, these are things that matter to him, so he should pay attention to the things yes. that the one thing that one thing that helps all of those things, which is a successful basketball program. Donna Shalala understood that. Brought in Pat yeah. Richter, who was the vice president of Oscar Meyer. He had no he was an alumni, but he had never worked in college athletics before. Mm-hmm. He went and hired Barry Alvarez to be the head coach, and the rest is history after that. Yes. Basketball, uh, the basketball program ended up getting better. They went to a surprise Final Four. They hired Bull Ryan. The, the history, there's history there. But they leveraged the potential success of their program to get, like, Herb Cole to give hundred, you know, dozens of millions of dollars to build the Cole Center. They've – not to say that Milwaukee is going to get Sacha Nadella, CEO of Microsoft and alumnus of the university – to give us dozens of millions of dollars to build an arena. I don't need them to build me an arena. You know, we do need that practice facility, which I, I, I understand there's some news on that. I haven't been, I've been very busy with work, so I haven't seen him. I was just got back from vacation, but, um, but we need to, you need to be able to, you know, leverage these things to get your program better because as your basketball program gets better, your university gets better. And for a lot of academic people, 
that is like grating on the ears because this idea that, oh, why the hell? A lot of, there's a lot of people in our university is, is definitely a shining well, example. What's interesting with that is, and, and I think we've talked about it this so in like episode. Money on athletics, but they don't, I think we've talked about this in episode. Yeah. With, it, 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 and it's funny you mentioned that because you have, and I think we've probably talked about this at least once or twice in the episodes past. At Cleveland State, the opposite is true. All of the donors, you know, like a you know, a Donald Washkowitz, the CEO of Parker Hannafin, sure. is already donating millions of dollars. They've, they've renamed the engineering college after him. Yeah. So it's interesting that you mention that dynamic where you want to try to get use athletic as a vehicle to get those don uh, those rich donors back. Where at Cleveland State the the opposite is true. The rich donors are already in academics. It's, uh, it, 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 so it, it's not, it's not, you don't just actually about, see, which is funny because you don't the, actually see, but you it's don't not see just the, the rich donors. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. But, but to your point also, and this is important as well. Um, I have always believed that it, because it seems to me that the, the approach to a lot of these schools is that, your focus is on throw a bunch, of, throw some advertising dollars out into onto the local radio stations and try to get sell tickets from the to the community first. That seems, and, and it may not be correct, but that is the perception I see. You do not have your 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 primary focus is on the community. If you're in a if you're in a major you know if you're a major marketplace, which literally everybody but Green Bay is. The, the advertising isn't really going to – there's not as much of a reach there, which is why I've always contended the the primary people – the primary focuses you need to have at your institution, at every single one of these institutions, is you need to focus on students, you need to focus on alumni, you need to focus on faculty and staff. People have a vested interest in your institution, and then what – and then – Focus your marketing on that. Focus your 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 energies on that, and then oh, I'll, after- tell you, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why they don't. They give a they give faculty and alumni a lot of times will get uh, they can get a discount. Yes, they do. Young alumni at our university, um, students don't As, pay. Yeah. Well, students do pay. They just don't know that they pay, which is another thing. I think that they should be at the beginning of every yeah. fall semester. I think that they should print out. Uh, I think that they should print out a send out a way uh, send a send out a voucher to every yeah. incoming freshman into their dorm mailbox saying, "Hey, you you have paid one hundred and twenty five dollars this semester towards the athletics department as this." Here are your vouchers for the basketball games, yeah. and then you have a, vo- a perforated thing with every every game on it. So you give students something in their hand that lets them know, oh, hey, by the way, you paid for this. You may want to take advantage of it. They don't do that. Uh, and they, I don't know. I don't it, know. There's a lot it, of institutions. That it was, do it was that. told to me by somebody that used to work there that in the athletic department on the. That might be, and that's probably so, true. It was told to me by somebody who works there that, that that they don't want to spend that money, which is not much money, because they're not sure if they'll have the actual advantages that that it, that it brings. But whatever, I I, I don't. What advantage? I don't what does it matter? What does it matter? <laughs> It matters. Um, they they all feel like they they're being backed into a corner with their with their budgets, which is ridiculous. Each budget's like eleven million dollars or something. Like it's 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 absolutely stupid. Maybe instead of you know going out and hiring a successor to uh, you know Charlie Gross, uh, the finance associate AD, uh, hiring a successor with less experience. Experience for twelve thousand dollars more every year, and, and salary. Maybe you should have turned around and spent that twelve thousand dollars, and got somebody comparable to who he was, or somebody who's maybe a little younger and hungrier for that job, and then taking that extra money and put it into, like you know, m- marketing to your students, getting your students. There. Maybe you know that mailer would be paid for several times over. The mailer, yeah. is kind of saying. You have, mean, to, you have to leverage what you have, and what yeah. we have 
what we have, what IUPUI has, what most schools in this conference has very large enrollments. Yes. And what we what we have is academics for the university. That's how you can get people to say, okay, on this game, game day for the Cavs, you know, the Cavs are hosting the the future Eastern Conference Championship Milwaukee Bucks. You know, instead of that, how about I'm going to go to the Cleveland State game because I'm a I'm a College of Business grad, and I want to move up in the world, and I know that that they're having a they're having a kind of like a a pregame networking event at the Cleveland State game down at the Wolstein Center in one of the in one of the side rooms. Maybe I should go there and you know rub elbows with some you know uh, really high highly successful alumni sure. that maybe I can find you know elbow my way in and get get you know get my foot in the door somewhere and advance my career. These are things that those people. Those young alumni, those middle-aged alumni, care about career yep. advancement. Sure and do. what Cleveland State can offer them is the opportunity to rub elbows with people who have already reached or gone beyond the level that they have ambitions for in their own careers. Yeah, that's something Absolutely. that they can do. Absolutely, and they don't. Why? <laughs> you know, like. And I, I, I forget the name. What was the name of the big donor you're talking about? Who's already giving money to the academic side of the university? Uh, that would be Donald Washkowitz, the CEO of Parker Hannifin. Okay, Donald Washkowitz, CEO of Parker Hannifin. Would you be willing to give us an evening of your time? Not asking for money at this moment. We know we are, we appreciate that you have given so much to this university, mm-hmm. so much above and beyond. What we'd like to do is we'd like to set up a, uh, a pregame kind of a, you know, this is a Saturday. We have a game at noon. We'd like to have a luncheon pregame at the Wolstein Center. Yeah. We'd like to recognize you at the game uh, for being a distinguished alumni. We'd like to have you here at this event. We're going to have 100 to 150 uh, uh, College of Business alumni that would like to talk, you know, that would like to – you know, shake your hand in this. Would you Would you be willing to do this? I don't think Donald Washkowitz is going to say no to that. Hey, sign me up for that. Well, I'd go. Right? What you don't yeah. do is take their money and then say, okay, I don't care what you're telling me. I'm still going to fire the basketball coach in the dumbest way possible. And Never mind. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I, I know where you were going with that, so I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> I'm not going to go deep into it. Yeah. But any Milwaukee fan that listens to this podcast that is not a fa- not a fan of me or anybody who lives in Wisconsin, turn on a television, watch all what watch watch where things are going. Every time you see a Wisconsin basketball game on, look at the court where it says Ab Nicholas Court for the late Ab Nicholas, who's the father of David Nicholas, who is our largest donor for a very long time. He was originally brought into the group because he uh, he, was, he became personal friends with Bruce Pearl when he got here, and he was a very, very ardent supporter of Rob Jeter, and he no longer gives money to the university. Uh, he definitely is not giving money in any specific large sums to the School of Business and uh, anybody who works you know, for the foundation or is in Chapman Hall where the chancellor's office is know what I'm talking about. And I'm still pissed that she haven't gotten rid of her because of that. And you should be pissed too. And I, I don't know why the school of business dean, the, the dean of the school of business, hasn't gone down and lit Chapman Hall on fire because of how much that woman cost the university. But whatever, that's just me. My point okay. is that turn on a television and watch David Gruber. David Gruber is uh, who? Who's the uh, who's the like personal injury lawyer you guys got? Is it Tim Misney? Is he the? Yeah. You guys have. Well, see, so, you're, you're from Milwaukee, and you know who Tim frickin' Misney is. You know, how, you know how I knew know who Tim Misney is. How do you know? Please tell me. I gotta hear this. Mike Polk's YouTube channel. Oh, for. <laughs> I love Mike Polk so much, and he did my, like my, like uh, ten, twelve yeah. years ago. He did a YouTube video where he like fakes a Tim Misney commercial, and it's hilarious. Yes. It's a minute. He, it's, 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 it, he at a comedy show. Mike Paul Jr. actually had Tim Misney 
and I can't. I don't know why I remember this, yeah. and I wish I hadn't. Apparently, he he brought, during a comedy show, he actually had Tim Misney go up on stage and read a chapter of I want to say one of the Fifty Shades books. Oh my god, you got to look it up. It is the most ridiculous thing ever. It's it's actually pretty funny. Um, you have, but yeah, you have, you have Tim Misney. Yes, we, we have David Gruber in Milwaukee. The David Gruber's one call. That's all. That's his. That's his like slogan. Two seven six 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 six. It's really funny. He has kind of an effeminate, like lispy voice when he's doing his commercials. In real life, he's got this like low raspy voice. I don't know how the both of those vo- voices <laughs> exist exist in the same body, but it's really funny. David Gruber is an awesome guy. It, it, you know, he's he's great. His son Steve's a good kid. I love, I love the whole family is great. Um, he like David Nicholas, originally brought to the fold by Bruce Pearl, became you know long term friends with with Rob Rob sure. Jeter and that, and has since you know s- stopped supporting athletics at the level yeah. that he has. You could turn on any sports game, and David Gruber, who used to appear in commercials talking about I'm a sport or a Milwaukee Panther athletics. Mm-hmm. You know, is now showing up in a supporter of Marquette Athletics. I'm a supporter of Wisconsin Athletics. David Nicholas, who's the CEO of Nicholas Investments, the 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 fund, the hedge funder, the investment firm that his father founded. His father played for the Badgers around World War II or something like that. He, after his father died, and he inherited the money as well as being the guy who runs this the large investment firm, gives a ton of money to the university. He gave a ton of money to the university of Wisconsin to put his father's name on the court. You have to treat these people well. And when you don't stupid shit happens. Yep. Sure does. Hey, it's Mark Money, stupid shit happens when you do stupid shit. Yeah. And, yeah my it's... You stupid so. shit. <laughs> All right. It's what happens. So university, but, yeah. They need to leverage what they've got. Leverage yes, the this night, is not, true. You are and, absolutely correct. I am 100% with you. Without don't the, just, uh, you don't just pick pockets. You get the, You give them what we don't have, yeah. networking. They need networking. Absolutely. You want to advance their careers. You put I think, the guy who used to be the CEO of Northwestern Mutual Insurance, the yeah. guy used to be the CEO of Harley-Davidson, the guy who used to run Johnson Controls. The guy, we have all these guys who used to be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. And now it's Sachin Nadella. God, if you get Sachin Nadella in here and you do a networking event around a basketball game where it's inter- alumni, alumni would pay a couple hundred dollars just to meet the man. So yeah, stupid. And, well, what's you interesting, let- and again, to your point, again, it, it and you do see that, and I think, it, at some institutions, and I, to your point, at some institutions, this does happen. It's just going, I, I think, to, to your point, if you – like moved one of those, and again, Cleveland State is really good at doing this. Washkowitz is on on, on campus all the time. Um, one of the um, Monty Ahuja, who is the founder of Transstar, big alumni donor. He's also well, you know he he's also very well in the you know Andy Puzder, and if that name, hey, sounds I know that name. Him. Yes, everybody knows that name because he's the CEO of Carl's Jr. and Hardee's and, you know, the, the architect of the most questionable commercials ever. And now he's being a dick on Twitter now. He was, he's, an, he's a Cleveland State alumni and he was, he's in the and he was being, and he was also, and he's also, he was also, you know, he's been on campus to do, you know, stuff. It's just a matter of really have being able to. Alumnus on campus? Uh, yes. You have an alumnus in the cabinet. No, he didn't. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, okay, no, he is not. No, he had to withdraw his name because he was a putz. He was oh. named. He was nominated for the Department of Labor. Is he the guy? That, is he the guy that Pete Davidson said looked like if Michael Fassbender played Magneto, or if he played if Michael Fassbender played Lex Luthor? I have to check this out. It, it, oh God, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, so Pete, yeah, yeah. Pete Davis looks like Brewers player Christian Yelich, by the way. Um, yeah, so, um, anyway, I just, just kind of wrap everything up. Yeah, we've had those. I think it's to your point, and I'm sure this has happened in. At a, I'm, I can't. I don't doubt that this has happened in other institutions. Uh, oh, totally the guy. If you are listening to this podcast, 
Go to your computer, open Google, uh, Google Andy Puzder, a- 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 Andy, and then last name P U Z D E R. I thought it was Puzner, but Puzder. Google Andy Puzner. Look at the first image on there and tell me, tell me that Pete Davidson from Saturday Night Live didn't knock it out of the park when he said that looks like Michael Fassbender playing Lex Luthor. It's the funniest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. It's so accurate. It's so All accurate. Right. Oh, enjoy that mental vision. Um, yeah, but again, to your point. There are institutions that have those rich donors who do do that. I think it's just a matter, to your point, to kind of kind of align it a little better, align it better with with your with, with your with with basketball. Just yeah. do that. That is, I guess, in an end around sort of way. Since this took us a while to get to this point, yeah, do that. That would be great. Yes. I would be totally. I would be on completely on board with that. Um, and so that is, you know. I guess at this point in time, now that we have given everybody the mental vision of what Andy Puzder looks like, um, <laughs> um, I, I think now it's just uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and close out the show here. Um, Andy Puzder is definitely welcome if he ever wants to come on the Horizon Roundtable. I just called him a dick. He's not coming on here. What is wrong with you? Well, maybe, um, <laughs> maybe he's maybe he likes that. I don't know. Maybe he's, uh, yeah. Maybe he'd be appreciative that you're honest about him. Who knows? All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> I doubt that very highly. Um, yeah. I that invitation highly. is also open to David Gruber and Tim Misney. Oh, David Gruber and Tim Misney. Okay, we'll, we'll make. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, you can't. You right, can't so. go five feet in Milwaukee without seeing David Gruber's face, and it used to be accompanied half of the time by the Milwaukee Panther logo, and now it's accompanied by the Badger logo and the Marquette logo. Brilliant. So, all right. So you can get. Yeah. So, um, as always, you can uh, listen to episodes of the Horizon Roundtable on SportsHacks.com, H-A-X.com. Uh, you can find us on, uh, you know, your podcast apps, uh, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn. You can. I did look that up. You can uh, say to your Google Home, uh, "Play podcast Horizon Roundtable," and it will bring it up. There you go. So, same you with can, Amazon and Alexa. You, and same with Alexa, that's how, yeah, that, and Alexa too. So yeah, so you can yeah, whatever your home device is, be it Google Home, be it Alexa, yeah, we got you covered too. So all right, so uh, that's it, and we'll and tune in next time for another episode of the Horizon Horizon Roundtable. Take care, everybody.